Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this session, Break the Bias for a Feminist Future. Happy Women's Day to all. My name is Elsa Marie Basilva, and I'm the founder of Red Dot Foundation. We are a nonprofit based in India and the USA, and we work on gender equality and justice. So we're still waiting for um, you know, more colleagues to join in, but it would be nice if you could introduce yourself and share where you're joining from. I know our speakers come from uh, Norway, of course, India, Mexico, Germany, and Kenya. Also, it would be nice if you could mute yourself. So I'm going to mute all. I'm going to mute all. So please keep yourself on mute. Uh, it would be nice if you could switch on your video because, uh, you know, we have two very senior leaders joining us uh, and it would be nice to acknowledge their presence as well. I know it's a virtual event and it tends to get a little heavy, but yes. So, um, so welcome everyone. Once again, my name is Elsa Marie De Silva and I'm the founder of Red Dot Foundation. And... Um, this is a gender alliance event. So a little bit about the gender alliance. So it is a cross network initiative bringing together feminists from the BMW Foundation Herbert Kwan's Responsible Leaders Network, the Global Diplomacy Lab, which is by the German Federal Foreign Office, the Bosch Alumni Network and the Global Leadership Academy community by the GIZ. And all members work pro bono and are creating their own work streams of collaboration to accelerate gender equality. This event is brought to you by the Women's Leadership Working Group, which is led by Barbara Bonner and Sylvia Mukasa. And today I'm stepping in for Barbara Bonner because uh, she had a parallel event uh, going on. So the theme, themes of this year's International Women's Day are Break the Bias and Advancing Gender Equality for a Sustainable Future. So we invited two CEOs to share their leadership journeys with us. We will first hear from Rama Kirloskar and then uh, Budwa Dennis. Then you'll have a chance to ask Q&A, uh, that's questions uh, with uh, the two of them. And then we will end with Sylvia Mukasa sharing some good practices on DE and I at the workplace. That's diversity, equity, and inclusion at the workplace. We want to keep it interactive. So do feel free to use the chat section to ask your questions or uh, share your thoughts because, uh, you know, we do like to hear what you're thinking as well. So I'm going to pass on to my colleague, Mina. Uh, Lopez Lu Luego, who is also part of the Gender Alliance and who is the responsible uh, leader network driver for Mexico, but she's currently based out of Munich, Germany. So over to you, Mina. Thank you, Elsa, and welcome everyone. I'm very excited because of this interview. A day ago, I met uh, Rama Kiroskar, and she's a woman with deep eyes and a very honest smile. The congruence between her words and actions give hope. She has a unique family background coming from five generations of women and men who have built a huge conglomerate. Kiroskar Brothers Limited, where engineering is at the core of the business since 1882. So you can imagine. Rama is a great, great, the great granddaughter of a business um, a woman who in the 50s founded a unique manufacturing unit employing only women. Rama is also the great grand niece of a, woman, of a woman that in 1916 founded three magazines when they were like uh, uh, maturing topics that they are very progressive and they did that until the 80s. With no doubt, Rama certainly comes from a very progressive background where women were and have been embraced for more than a hundred years and when gender equality existed even before it was called like that. Rama is a charter of energy, the living proof that the feminine aspect and sustainability can go together. It will be very interesting to learn from her how to live the dream that we all dream. So welcome, Rama. Thank you so much, Mina. That was a, that was a, a very kind introduction, I would say. <laughs> no, that's all what I see. And you know, when 
It was amazing learning about the, all this, this background and these amazing women, because I remember since I was a little child, I was always like trying to see and look around people that inspired me. And we were talking, of course, in this day, we're talking about women, but it's very important that we also talk about men. I know that your dad was instrumental in setting an all women plant. And when I say all women plant, it is all women, like workers are, are, are women, the leaders are, are women, the managers are women. It is something really unique and it has been very successful. So it would be great for us to, to know more about it because it is successful. And you know, from Mexico, we have this quote that is horrible, but it says, mujeres juntas ni difuntas, that it means that women together, not even there. And you have proved that that is not true. They are working in a very, very good environment, achieving a lot of things. And I would like to know a little bit more about that. And what are, for example, in the case of your dad, what kind of arguments he received against this idea? And what is the impact that this successful plant has had, not just in the women, but in the community? And of course, something very important. How do men empowering women as your dad inspire you? So, uh, Mina, let me start by, you know, just telling you a bit, uh, uh, giving you a background about how this all women's plant started. So uh, this is part of our uh, retail business. So we are a 130 year old company and we have a very large variety of products and we have a made to stock business, which is a retail business. We have a made to order business and a engineered to order business. We actually, you know, we have all, all the extremes um, of product ranges within uh, our group. And uh, I'm going to focus on our made to stock range, which is our mass production business. And uh, this business is around 60 years old within this company. And uh, my father had this, this idea of starting an all women's plant. And he said that, you know, at the end of the day, um, when there's no water in the house, specifically in rural India, it is the women that need to get up at 3 and 4 a.m. in the morning and walk um, many, many kilometers to fetch that water. And he felt, you know, why not empower those women and give them an opportunity to um, create the kind of quality products that would take them out of this plight. And that's, that's really um, his um, strategy or his thought process behind setting up this kind of plant. So in 2011, we set up an all women managed and operated plant in this village called Kanyur, which is 30 kilometers out of Coimbatore. Coimbatore is a city in Tamil Nadu. And we started off with uh, 60 women between the ages of 19 and 30, and they were all eight standard dropouts. Now, before I go on to how we set up the plant, I'd like to give a bit of a background of this village. So this village, Kanyur, had a, a um, you know, this background of child marriage. And it was very, very prevalent at the time. And women and women were looked upon as a burden. Parents were wanting to marry them off um, and get rid of this burden, really. And when this opportunity arose um, of, you know, having women uh, work in a factory, I think uh, the women there were very excited. Um, we were able to enroll around 60 women at this factory. And... Um, we essentially took eight standard dropouts. So they were unskilled workers. And we gave them a six month rigorous on the job training. And the program was so successful, I would go to the extent of saying that, that these women are better than many of the ITI graduates that you get today. And after that six month training program, we started our lines. And uh, today they have made it, not today, but a few years ago, they made it to the Limca Book of Records, which is equivalent to the Guinness Book of World Records for being able to uh, assemble a, a pump in the fastest amount of time. So they make one pump every 17 seconds. They are our most productive plant in India. And we will be converting all our mass production units uh, eventually to all women, specifically in the production line. And... Um, I mean, we're, we're not doing this um, uh, as, a, as a PR activity, right? Uh, this actually makes business sense. Um, it, it adds, it contributes substantially to your bottom line when you enhance productivity. Now, at the, at the time when we started this plant in 2011, maybe three or four years down the line, we wanted to enhance 
um, the the quantities of products that were made. And we felt okay, right? And at the time in India, we were not allowed to have women in the third shift. And so we thought, let's talk to our women workers there about this and see what they have to say. So first, First of all, they, they hated this idea. They thought it was a terrible idea to bring to start a third shift and have men there. And they told us that, let's see what type of numbers you're looking at. And we'll ensure that we make these that quantity in two shifts to start a third shift. This. That's, that's the kind of productivity that we have from that plant. That's the kind of uh, determination that these women have. And I think more than just providing jobs, and opportunities, it's created a huge social change. And this social change is really satisfying for us as a company, uh, simply because now you don't have child marriage there. Um, these families don't want to marry their girls off. And many times, um, these women say, pump that broke down and I was able to help my neighbor and they call me madam, I'm getting respect. So I think it's very empowering for, for these women to have this kind of experience. Also, you know, when we started this experiment, I think people thought it was a ridiculous idea. They thought it was just, you know, doomed from the beginning. They thought we'd have huge absenteeism. They felt that the women would get married away, married off, and then eventually leave the job. They've gotten married and they've relocated their husbands to this village. So I think it's created a huge impact in this area. So that is that is one area where we have added women um, into our mass scale production unit. The other one that we've recently started, three years ago, we've inaugurated a uh, precision casting facility, uh, which does uh, lost foam uh, castings. It's very, it's very much like lost wax, but they use foam, so it's very light. And that also has majority women uh, in, in this foundry. So I think we are seeing huge productivity and what we've noticed that specifically for light repetitive work, women far outperform men. So we are going to keep um, uh, utilizing their skill sets in that part of our business. Thank you, Rama. And, and something very important, how, what is for you this example? Because your dad was the one that started uh, with all of this and So they were not, of course, so what empower women. What is, what is the kind of influential that you receive from women like that? You know, I think my father is a very determined man. So when he wants to do something, he's going to do it. No one, no one can stop him. And I think um, that specifically at, at somebody at a leadership position, I think when they are progressive, they can create huge impact in an organization, but even in, in a country, right? And I think that that is what is most important. I think in our family, um, as, as we had spoken earlier, Mina, is uh, right from our founder, right? We've had a lot of women um, running businesses in our family. So my great grandmother in the 1950s used to run a bimetal bearings unit in India in the 1950s. And I think it was really one of its kind. And she employed 100% des I mean, Essentially, it was a 100% women-operated uh, plant again, and it employed destitute women. And I think this was a very progressive thought uh, at that time, which was when India had just come, um, was just, just became independent, right? 1947 was when we got our independence. So it was very, very early, um, early on in India. And I don't think anybody else was doing this in the country. Uh, that was my grand great grandmother. My grand aunt used to run a hotel business. Um, I also spoke to you about our uh, my grand my other grand aunt who used to run our three magazines. Um, our magazines called Three Manohar um, and Kirloska, which ran from which were published from 1916 to the 1980s, which spoke about very progressive concepts at the time, such as widow remarriage, um, girl child education. So we've always been progressive as a family, and I think. Um, of course, my father would have seen all these strong women in his family, and I think uh, that would have impacted him and his thinking when when he was growing up. So he, you know, he is he is a feminist. He believes in women empowerment, and um, he has done that in his own company and and showed that giving equal opportunity to women 
and providing them with a safe working environment uh, essentially allows women to reach as far as men and it helps to bridge that gender gap that we see today. I think those are essentially the two components. We don't do any sort of affirmative action in our company. We don't think it's required simply because if women are given equal opportunities in a safe working in environment, they really don't need anything else. They are fully capable of uh, reaching the pinnacles of success in life. Uh, and that is amazing, Rama, because it is, it is a great example. It's something that we don't have like very often, you know, companies that they already have in their the DNA, this, this gender equality since the beginning, because it's With, with the family, but it has been happening for more than a hundred, a hundred years. So for you, it was like really like natural to come here and start working because that was never a, a, a barrier, right? But that is unfortunately that is not happening uh, all around uh, the world. We are like trying to find out how we can develop this kind of safe working environments. How can we make like this equality and inclusion something that is a reality? How do you think we can break the bias? and make gender equality a reality for a sustainable development? So, Mina, I would like to first answer that question by saying that I believe that because we are progressive in our thinking processes as a family, I, I think that's the very reason we have been able to last for 130 years, because we've actually not barred people uh, from reaching places because of their gender, right? It's all merit-driven, it's all capability-driven. And if I, I were to take parallels from history, you, you notice that different uh, empires, uh, whether it was Genghis Khan's empire or the Mughal empire or the British empire, uh, they all had women in administrative roles. And I do believe that that makes the empire more sustainable in the long run. You see all of the successful empires throughout history, they have had a very active participation of women. And I think that's the same for companies. If companies want to last they will need to have more women in their workforce. Uh, coming back to bridging the gap, right? I think um, there are a lot of different issues uh, today why there might be less women in the workforce. And I want to concentrate more on upbringing, right? Because I think that problem starts uh, right from childhood. I think that for boys, when they're growing up, it's very clear that they need to build a career for themselves, right? They're told from a young age that you need to be self-reliant and you need to be the breadwinner. That's not always the case with girls. That's not the kind of upbringing they, they are given. Many times they have been told, oh, eventually you'll get married, you know? So eventually you're going to be a dependent. And then what happens is that they then make the life, those life choices in accordance with the destination that their parents have told them they're going to get to. And I think if you tell women that, hey, you know, you are, you are fully capable of being independent, you can um, do exactly what you please and you can build a career for yourself, then you will ensure that automatically you'll see women um, going into those streams that allow them to um, have more financial independence. So I think it starts uh, from a very young age because as, as, as a businesses and as, as industry, we only get to meet women when they are 22, 23, right? And their mindset is, it's already set by that time. And I think for women, one of the main reasons of this whole gender gap at the workplace, the gender inequality, I think is because this whole burden of, of having children um, falls onto the, women, onto the woman, right? I mean, um, marriage is not an equal partnership. It's an unequal partnership. And I think women need to be told um, that there are certain consequences. And, the thing is that there are going to be consequences either way. You choose a career, there's going to be a consequence um, or, or a compromise. And if you choose um, family, there's going to be a compromise. There's going to be a compromise either way. The real question is, which compromise are you more willing to accept? And I think girls need to be told that, that you know, if you want to have a family, you want to get married, that's fine. That's fine if that's really what you want to do. Uh, but if you are career oriented, right? And I know a lot of women um, of my age group who are, who are told, right? Or who were told when they're 22, 23, that, you know, you can get married and then have children and your career, you can do that parallelly and you'll get where you want to. But in reality, that's not really where it pans out. 
uh, many of these women need to take long breaks to take care of their children. And that does, they, they do have to make compromises on where they, they eventually get in their career. Because, I mean, today companies want people to be vice presidents, executive directors by the time they are 38, 40, right? And children take a good chunk of your 20s um, out of your, you know, those years that you're building that foundation for a great career, they take a lot of time. And girls need to be told that, you know, if you take that marriage path, you will need to compromise that VP position. And I feel that they need to be told these things. Otherwise, they end up making the wrong dec decisions and eventually get disappointed in life. And if they want that family life, that's great, right? But if they don't want it, then I think it's a bit, then it can be painful for them. Yeah, and we actually commented how important it is when women want to have a professional career, or also when men, they want to be more closer to the family, right? So yes. this is something in which we have to be like more like, being like with a better better balance between men and women. Right, and, and Nina, that's, 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 you know, thank you for reminding me about that point. You know, at the end of the day, um, men don't have it all either, right? I mean, no one really has it all, that's a myth. And uh, I, I was just saying, we talk about women's equality all the time, but, but in reality, uh, women do have a middle path, right? They have a choice. They have a choice of whether I want to have a career or do I want to get married and settle down? Men don't have that choice in, in at least most of most societies around the world. They have to have a career, whether they like it or not. I know many men who've had to leave their you know, passion of painting or acting and go for, you know, those, those jobs that make, make money. And they don't necessarily like those jobs. And I feel that in today's day and age, when both men and women have aspirations, I think it's important to find a partner who's complementary, right? And I feel that if today's career-oriented women are expecting men to accept the fact that, you know, I'm married and I'm also career oriented, then I feel there should be career oriented women who also accept that there are men out there who don't want a career and may want to be the primary caregiver in the family. And I have seen such uh, families. I mean, when I was in the US, I, I went to a women's college. I did see a lot of my um, classmates' parents where the father was a stay at home dad. And I, th I think he did a great job bringing up his children because um, you know, they were balanced, they had a good value system. Um, there was absolutely nothing wrong. So I, I think uh, that I think women need to be more accepting of that as well if you want to bring in this sort of equality. Yeah, thank you, Rama. It has been amazing. I think the things that we can take from this conversation are very important. How important is childhood? How important is to develop safe working environments, to take care of our culture inside of our companies, because that is going to be the DNA. And that gender equality is, is gender equality, is both for men and women. So it has been amazing having this conversation with you, Rama. For the, the people that they want to ask questions, you can put them in, in the chat. We're going to remain here. And at the end, we're, Rama is going to answer to your questions. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you, Rama. And thank you, Meena. That was really thought provoking. And now I have the pleasure of uh, being in conversation with Budwa. Uh, he is the CEO of BMW Group in Norway. Hi. Welcome, Budwa. How are you? Hi. Good, good afternoon. Good evening to you in Asia. Um, I'm fine. I'm very happy. I'm very honored to be invited uh, to this discussion. Uh, many women actually should be there in my place and uh, share their experiences. Uh, we met a few years ago and uh, we started some very interesting discussion but I, I just would like to say thank you for inviting me and uh, wishing everyone, women and men, a very happy Women's Day. Thank you, Budwa. And, uh, you know, we wanted to have a discussion not just with women CEOs but also male CEO because it's about uh, everyone. Gender equality is about male allyship as well. And yes. I met you first at the Berlin Global Table in 2019, where you attended my session called The Female View. And post that, we had a conversation where you brought in some of your senior leadership. At that time, you were the BMW uh, group head in uh, Poland. Uh, and I'm just curious, you know, what did you 
think about that female view and then wanted to go into the deeper discussion. Plus, you know, we just heard from India, but you're sitting in a different part of the world, Scandinavia and Norway, where gender equality means completely different and their standards are so different. But you've lived in many countries. You're from France. You've also worked in Hungary and Poland and now in Norway. So can you share a little bit you know, some of these examples of uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion that you personally have uh, been part of and uh, believe in. Yeah, thank you, Elsa. And also thank you, um, uh, Hama and uh, Mina for the previous discussion. Very inspiring. Very, very much resonating to things um, I, I have also experienced uh, sometime in different countries. So uh, to, maybe just before talking about Norway first, maybe, because this is where I'm sitting today. Um, so I am, yes, I'm French and I, I grew up in France. Um, I married a French American lady. Um, uh, we have four, four daughters, so five ladies. Um, and uh, well, not at home anymore because they are grown-ups now, and there three out of four are not with us anymore. Uh, they are they are abroad. But um, we've been traveling in different countries. We've spent more time uh, actually outside of France and in France, in Germany, in Asia, uh, China, Japan, and Philippines, and in Europe, Belgium, France again, uh, Germany, um, Hungary, Poland, and today Norway. And the topic of uh, gender uh, equality and diversity has always been for me a very interesting and important topic. Not, not because I have uh, the pleasure to have four daughters, but because I noticed from a very long time that this requires clear improvements and that men have an important role there to break bias and to lead by example to even if sometimes things are obvious that it's important to repeat them and as much as possible, of course, to lead by example. So when we met Elsa in Berlin a few years ago, uh, I shared with you an example that I can also share in a minute, but first Norway. Norway and you said Scandinavia is very privileged and I can really confirm. I've been here now for more than a year and it's very impressive to see how um, men, women, uh, in professional life, are the, the, the responsibilities are very balanced. And just to share one example, when I arrived, my, my right hand in the, in the team, uh, one of the head of sales, the head of sales, informed me that um, he just got a, a baby and that he will take five months off as a parent to leave. And I, so I was expecting expecting something like this, but I never actually experienced it personally, directly. And my first question was, of course, uh, I can uh, very much imagine very well the great benefit uh, at home um, uh, for, for him, for his life partner and for their baby. Uh, but I was just wondering, how does it work usually in Norway in such a situation? And it was actually very natural because this happens every day. And then there is either an interim person or someone from the team is taking over responsibility, which is what we have organized. And it went very well. It was remarkable. And in the meantime, other colleagues, um, men, are on parental leave or have been in parental leave. And it is extremely smooth and natural. And this was new to me. I've never experienced in 30 years in different countries, uh, uh, this balanced and easy way of doing it, giving the equal chance for the mother to have a fulfilling professional life uh, when the uh, children's daddy is taking care of the children. At, at an age where it's not easy, of course, to have the children in the kindergarten because it's too early. Impressive, and Avia and Norway are uh, benchmarks in this uh, topic. But also, I think in the way, in the position, women uh, have naturally in a team uh, and are fully respected 
Um, and that is really, I think, fantastic. It's a, it's a very inspiring. Um, I would not say everything is perfect because I was yesterday evening, my, um, um, my Norwegian teacher, I'm taking Norwegian lessons. And uh, she's, a, she's a, a senior lady, experienced 20 years working with foreigners. And I was asking her, so tomorrow is Women's Day. Uh, is that important in Norway? Just to trigger a bit the, you know, the answer. And she said, oh yes, that's super important. We know we are privileged. We know this is a great situation, but there are still many things to improve, many um, uh, bias that needs to be uh, uh, broken. And that's very interesting. So that it's, it's a never ending story. And that talking about it and walking the talk, I believe is super important. So that was just one example about Norway. So if I may, and from another country, uh, one example that I was sharing with you is um, uh, in, in another country, no, maybe just, I was thinking, uh, uh, as a contrary to Norway, another European country where I spent uh, some years, years ago, a long time ago, uh, one of my colleague, uh, women, um, announced to the team that she was pregnant. And, uh, you know, everyone said, oh, fantastic, congratulations. Uh, and then she told me at the following coffee break that it was not such a good news for her. She was very happy, but she had to choose whether stopping her career for two, three years or having a child. And if you compare to Norway, it's completely opposite. And this was just a few years ago in Western Europe. So it is sometimes very different. And we have, uh, and I was surprised because coming from France where um, there is a social system that allows mothers or young, uh, uh, so mothers with young children to continue their um, uh, professional life without interruption almost. And that's very, understood and accepted and supported. So very different situations also in Europe, in different European places. So back to the previous case, which is completely different. Um, it, uh, yeah, I had a case uh, in a team where, uh, uh, in my team, where um, uh, I was informed after uh, months, uh, I was not aware of uh, harassment from one man towards one and then to women. And this harassment um, became, uh, I mean, it's always unacceptable, but it became um, dramatic, I would say, when it started to be, to have sexual uh, connotations. It was verbal, but still it is indeed characterized as sexual harassment. So, um, after a thorough investigation, the decision was to uh, separate uh, with this person and uh, to create space for women to, to talk. And I offered, uh, uh, in, in, we had a discussion, and this is Elsa, what I was sharing with you as well, to create uh, a women's forum. And uh, this was surprisingly not well perceived by everyone. Uh, and I was surprised. Uh, the idea was to create a space of trust and um, confidentiality where women together could express things that they may not have felt being able to express in a mixed uh, environment, being maybe afraid of judgment or uh, of being contradicted. So um, uh, then one man said, uh, but why don't we create a men's uh, uh, um, forum then? And uh, it was interesting because it said, but that's, that's not the topic. The topic here is that women do not have uh, uh, enough, um, there is, not this space of, of trust and confidentiality. And of course, the idea, you remember we were talking about it, the idea was at the beginning, this forum would be, of course, during office hours in the office, 
allowed at the beginning or open at the beginning only for women. And then when uh, trust and uh, uh, self-confidence would be there, the women would be the right to welcome men to have shared discussions and open discussions and therefore um, talk, express. It's so important to talk about this in the companies because sometimes we believe it's obvious. We we believe, of course, no, it's not an issue, but maybe it is, and we don't know. So that was for me a big eye opener that what we take for granted is sometimes uh, not what it is at all. And walking the talk, repeating obvious things, um, create then space for discussion, space for exchange. Does it make sense? Absolutely. You brought up so many important points. <laughs> you know, you spoke about the paternity leave as parental leave. And I think five months is really generous. In fact, one of our Gender Alliance members went on uh, uh, parental leave. And even though he, we, he thought of himself as an ally, he wrote this very moving uh, blog, which Camilla has kindly posted in the chat section. I, I quote it everywhere because, you know, it's unless you go through it, you don't know what it really means. And therefore, thank you for sharing as a leader how, you know, you always knew that was a possibility, but what does it really mean to implement that policy is something else. And the second point is about creating safe workspaces. And Rama also touched upon it, where if you give a safe workspace, um, in your organization, women will, you will have more women wanting to work, and then it won't be an issue. So thank you for creating that. You know, Rama spoke in her uh, segment about the importance of her father's vision. And, uh, you know, we talk about male allies, and you clearly are a male ally. So all those male allies listening, what would you recommend to them? How, how can they step up to being an ally? What is required? Well, um, and the first, I mean, for me, what I would say spontaneously is that the first thing is to um, listen. And listen for real. Not listen to judge or not listen to, to respond, but listen to make sure the people who are talking are feeling being listened. So I mean, means reformulating, repeating what you've heard to the person, because this is the foundation of a dialogue. And then um, making sure that basic values, shared values um, are understood. So it's great to have them on the wall, but if they are not pressed, if they are not discussed, and if they are not lived, it's useless. So listening, um, repeating um, is very important. And uh, yeah, walking the talk, of course, the leading by example, um, pushing, the, pushing the boundaries. I remember some years ago uh, for a salary increase um, a review, um, I was told I I was uh, I was new in this uh, in this place, and the the HR person, uh, a lady, was pointing at me the salary difference, the average salary difference between men and women. And uh, I purposely decided to give a much significantly more, uh, a higher increase, to women than to men to correct this difference. And I did this several years, once after, you know, because there is absolutely no reason that for a similar job, similar responsibility, uh, uh, a man and a woman would not have the same salary. This is, this is just unacceptable. So, and giving those signals, uh, one after the other, this is, this is one. Of course, an, another one very obvious is when recruiting uh, or promoting people, 
favoring women if possible, if there is the opportunity. And this is um, a necessity to correct unbalance. Um, and this is very important and it needs to be explained because sometimes it's, it can be perceived a bit uh, um, unfair. It's not unfair, it is fair. It is rebalancing um, to achieve a level that sh should be normal. Thank you for bringing that up, Budwa, because it's, they say that it's going to take 136 years for the wage parity to kick in. And we cannot wait for 136 years for sure. The time is now. And with male allies like yourself, we can recalibrate. So thank you for that. You brought up very, very important points. I really um, am very grateful for your leadership, for uh, you know being able to work with you on this topic and thank you so much i'm going thank to invite you yeah i'm going to invite thank you for your help because you've been you've been very helpful okay thank you thank you that's great so now we are going to um you know i'm going to ask meena is there any chat question for rama or budwa yeah we have a question for rama and rama this is a question from i hope i'm pronouncing this correctly Rajeshri. Sorry if I didn't pronounce your name correctly. And she's asking, Rama, how do you deal with situations which require tough decisions to be taken given that generally we could be viewed as being high on the EQ? Um, Nina, maybe we could ask Rajeshri if she could maybe elaborate more on that question. Yeah, sure. Do you want to unmute your mic? Sorry, that there we have it. Yeah, yeah. What do you mean? Played Maya because uh, first and foremost, um, seeing a woman leader, okay, and seeing you in an industry which is completely dominated by men, okay. Um, so ninety eight percent, and I don't want to get into figures, is dominated by men. I'm sure there would be situations wherein, given your position and given uh, the sector in which you operate, there are certain tough decisions that you need to, or tough situations that you need to deal with. Um, how do you and uh, add it? Uh, and you know, in addition to that, you also will probably you we do land up in a group which kind of has this perception that okay, you know, she's going to be the softer one. She's going to be dealing with the softer issues. So there is that, what I would say is a perception that is already created. How do you really deal with something like this? Rajeshri, that's a great question. <clears throat> you know, from my experience, I actually look at that as an advantage, right? Specifically when you're in a very competitive industry, I think it's a good thing if my competitor uh, underestimates me, to be honest because it gives you a huge advantage. And uh, I think there are many times where that underestimation has cost them dearly. So I think, it, I think every disadvantage has an advantage and we need to really look at the flip side. Uh, that was to answer your first question. And second question, uh, second question that you had um, regarding those tough decisions. I mean, I feel that I'm not fit to be in my position if I don't have the ability to take those tough decisions. I mean, you just have to do what you have to do, right? Uh, whether it's for the welfare of your company or it's for the welfare of your employees, um, that's, that's inevitable. So I think when taking those decisions, you need to look at it very logically and not really care about what people think. You have to do what is right. Well said. Yes, thanks. Well thanks said. for that, yeah. Thank you. I think Amita wanted to ask a question. I know she cannot switch on her video, but Amita, would you like to unmute and uh, share a question? And Amita is our responsibility. Hey, thank you, Elsa Marie. Um, thank you, Baduin and Rama. This was a great session. Uh, I have one question for each of you. Uh, so I'll start with Rama. Uh, my question to you, Rama, is that, you know, in a world that is so... Um, you know, focused on talking about equity. Uh, I find that in a lot of uh, sense, it's only uh, paying lip service. 
and everything is tied down to you know increasing productivity profitability blah blah but at the core of the issue i think uh, even as a woman i mean i've been working for close to three decades now even today when i walk into a room i feel very unwelcome and i have to make an attempt to feel welcomed okay i have to make an attempt to make the men in the room uh, feel included you know it's the other way around and no matter how much we speak the action really is not i think the intent is wrong how do we change the intent that's my question to you and uh, to uh, bajain um, my question to you is uh, you know i've met a lot of uh, male allies who uh, on a one on one conversation are completely supportive of you but they hold back big time speaking out when there are more than two people in the room and how do you change that i'm sure you've noticed this i'm sure you've experienced Mama, please go ahead sure thanks thanks bodhu uh, so anita to answer your question i think the first thing is we just need to have more women in the workforce and more representation i think uh, encouraging women and it again boils down to upbringing how do you bring up your daughter right what what do you teach her when she's young what do you is going to be uh, maybe 20 years down the line i think that requires a lot of planning specifically when it comes to women because they should be clear what they want to do and i feel that if there is clarity given to women when they are very young they would end up a lot of them would end up um, maybe being a little more um influential in their careers because they wouldn't be compromising so much they'd be higher up uh, the ladder in all their organizations because i've said this before is powerful women create space for more women right from the top of the pyramid to the bottom so you just need to have more women and that will ensure you have more powerful women at the top so i i hope that answers your question thank you rama i totally agree with you and uh, you know um over the years i have made sure that my team has 50% women where the organization that i uh, work with has i think there are about 20% women in the workforce so um completely changed the trajectory because we were 100% male team a team that was 100% male till i joined in <laughs> um and uh, your point about bringing up our daughters to be uh, to have clarity and to uh, become a woman of influence i completely agree with you um i have a 20 year old daughter who is not liked by many because she's very opinionated uh and uh, i feel very proud of that and i completely agree with you on that thank you rama yeah, amita you know just i'd like to add one more point to that right many times in organizations historically they have been very patriarchal right and i think it needs a certain type of leader who would like to turn away from top line bottom line cash flow and actually look at the social issues that that um, you know hurt the company in the long run i think they're just leaders who are too preoccupied with the numbers it may not necessarily be um, a patriarchal system they just want to possibly take the path of least resistance because it's just easier for them to do that rather than change the system that could also be one reason why uh, most men don't bother taking the effort of getting more women in the organization simply because it's not their priority the kiaris are not based on it and 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 why should they take that risk right because even when we were starting our plant i remember there were people telling my father that you know maybe we train all these women and they leave they they are absent should we bother but because of the upbringing that my father had as a child and because of the role models he saw i don't believe there was a, a minute uh, there was even a second doubt in his mind that this is not going to work he always knew it's going to work and and the question that he asked himself is how do we make this work not if it will work uh rama i completely agree with you i just want if i can i'll just add one bit i think it's also about how we bring up our uh, our sons uh the the mindset shift is not just with our daughters i think uh, men who are comfortable uh, with women you know holding their ground in any conversation in any room 
Uh, so thank you so much, Rama. Absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. And now we have a question from Manolo. And this question is really interesting because Manolo is part of a group that we have about men. Men that are helping us to engage men, but they are also supporting us. And, and Manolo is someone that is an amazing responsible leader and he's a grand, grand dad now. And he's asking this question and this question, I think it would be great for you, Boudoir. There's are great examples like Rama and Dennis Bravo, but how do we break the patriarchal models inherited from fathers to sons, from men to boys, from mother to daughters, and from women to girls? Okay, that's a very good one. Um, if I can just answer uh, Amita's question earlier, she was asking me about, um, uh, and it's a very good question, uh, how do we um, uh, pursue uh, this when resistance is ahead of us? And you were saying uh, uh, in a bilateral meeting or if there's two, two people things, then the ambition sometimes is decreasing. Um, certainly, I think this is certainly true, uh, no doubt. Uh, I think it's about making small, small steps, little by little, every day, or big steps, of course, that's better, but small steps are still good, and to um, speak up, to explain, um, to make sense, because one thing is, and I fully agree, Rama, with what you said earlier, that sometimes you need to make the right decisions, even if um, it's maybe not well understood. However, after or before doing the right decision, which is not to be compromised, still it needs to be explained and to be uh, so that people that it makes sense. If it doesn't make sense, there there will be no acceptance uh, long term, not even short term, but also not long term. So changing uh, patterns, uh, changing bias uh, is something that requires regular efforts. And I believe in this small step approach, just to answer your, your question. Um, uh, and I'm sorry, your, your, Mina, your, your second question was about- It was from, from Manolo. Yes. That actually, uh, Manolo is here. Manolo, I don't know if you want to open your, your microphone because you're amazing expressing this kind of, of questions. No, I don't think we have him uh, in the possibility to open. His question is about, we have great examples with Rama and Dennis, but how can we break the patriarchal models inherited from fathers to sons, from ah, yes. men to boys, from mother to daughters and from women to girls. Rama was telling a lot about ch childhood, right? But how can we, what can we do with these patriarchal models? Yeah, I mean, I, I can talk about my example. I was brought up in a traditional family, industrial, uh, where um, I think it's fair to say that boys were not treated um, professionally the same way as girls. And there was this preconceived idea or this um, structure, mental structure, that it was okay like this. And uh, this time has completely changed. I mean, I don't think, I mean, it was certainly um, logical or easy to replicate generation after generation this pattern uh, years ago. But today, uh, I think it is probably not possible or extremely difficult. Why? Because there are so many good examples showing that the importance of uh, diversity of the added value of diversity. Diversity cannot be um, presented as a dogma, as an obligation. It must be understood as a benefit for uh, everyone. Um, and once people experience it, see it, understand it, then it's easy to change the pattern, I believe. Thank you, but Boudoir and Rama. This was a very interesting conversation. 
Uh, thank you so much for your time, for your wisdom, and for sharing your expertise. And, um, you know, Budwa, you said you would also like to hear what are some of the good practices. So we've invited our colleague, Sylvia, who's also part of the equity circle in the BMW Foundation Responsible Leader Network, to share a few um, good practices with us. So thank you very much. And Sylvia, over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Elsa, for the opportunity. And thank you, everyone, for showing up. My name is Sylvia Mukasa, and I am based out of Nairobi, Kenya, in East Africa. Uh, nice to be engaging today. So um, as I begin to speak, uh, probably, uh, Camila, kindly share the slide uh, with the good practices as I carry on with the conversation. I'll try to not utilize the 10 minutes because we don't have much time. Um, so a lot of you know that um, di diversity is more about representation um, or the makeup of an entity. And inclusion is about how well the contributions, mm -hmm. presence and perspectives of different groups of people are valued and integrated into an environment. So just what are some of the best practices? Um, I tried to capture those um, in that slide. So uh, just follow through as I try to guide us through this. Um, so the first thing I'd like to talk about is sense of belonging. So it's about having a connection, uh, making sure that people have a connection to an organization that makes them feel that they can be themselves and this will actually lead to greater engagement and creativity in the workplace. And it's also a psychological need. So it's very important to make people feel they connect with an organization or group. The other is empathy. And here I'd like to, to focus more on empathetic leadership. And this involves each person remembering a time when they felt excluded, shamed, interrupted, and you know, other, other um, things that have gone through um, you know, your experiences in an organization. It's not a one size fits all approach, but it's important to share best practices and be open to trying new things. And as we speak about um, best practices, I'd like to point out on the ISO 30415 on human resource management, which touches on diversity and inclusion. And this provides the fundamentals for organizations wishing to create an inclusive workplace and capitalize on the opportunities that this can offer. So this standard covers actions, principles, measures, and their associated accountabilities and responsibilities and takes into account the unique context of each workplace. So this standard can actually be used for both staff and stakeholders, and it was developed by a technical committee um, under of the American National Standards Institute, um, which is an I and uh, ISO members of the USA. And it can be purchased on the ISO store or uh, through ISO member states. I'll share the link in the chat section uh, for those who would be interested in having a look at it or using it um, if you really don't know where to start as an organization. Um, and then we also need to have ongoing inclusion. So it's not enough to teach employees what it means to be inclusive. Um, like any form of behavior change, inclusion requires individuals to identify key moments in which to build new habits or micro behaviors, which can actually be practiced and measured. And when these habits are put into action in an environment that supports honest conversations and healthy tension, real change then becomes possible. So it's important to equip your teams or employees with the skills and information to help them champion to change uh, champion for change within their department teams or, or working groups in um, any other uh, groups they may be part of. And then um, we've all had a quarters, um, especially when it comes to hiring decisions. So you want more women on your teams or you want people from different races on your teams. As much as quarters may boost diversity numbers, they won't automatically create an inclusive culture. Very often leaders will focus on diversity and inclusion efforts disproportionately on the employee pipeline, but the employee continues beyond 
them being given an offer letter. The other thing is considering your brand. So brand and culture are intimately connected. The products and services you put into the world reflect your values and your biases. So in the journey towards building a more inclusive organization, it's important to consider the relationship between what's happening inside and out of your company. So um, ask yourself questions like, what is your brand saying about your culture? And in what ways I customer base and what experiences are being left out on this kind of street. The other thing is to minimize fear. And we can do this by finding ways to frame challenges through a lens of possibility. And um, what some organizations have done um, is ensuring that this sharing of experiences and storytelling to elevate power. And um, another way to do this is have a commitment tree where every employee writes down their personal and individual commitments to diversity and inclusion, and then put them in a public space uh, so they could see um, signs of their progress and celebrate them as well. Then um, it's also important to help individuals thrive. So we've been talking about allyship and those kind of things. Um, what, what some organizations do is they focus on company fit, even when they're hiring. Does this person fit into our company culture? So the norms, power structures, and inequities in society can easily become embedded in an organization. Um, and you know, through optimizing to hire, train, and reward people who fit. So creating a culture where every individual can contribute their full potential requires investigating your systems and processes in your organization to uncover which are the sore spots and blind spots, and then finding ways to reimagine them. Uh, and finally, a top-down approach isn't enough. So a lot of us will say leaders should be the ones who are driving um, inclusion, um, diversity and equity. And that is true. But um, a lot of the top-down approach does, it drives compliance and is not necessarily commitment. So for senior leaders to frontline employees, every in individual must see and understand their role in company culture. Um, this means identifying um, differences in employee experience and values across the organization so that change can be made relevant to each person and knowing that lasting change must activate different parts of the system. So here um, we're looking at a mixed approach, which is about top down, bottom up and middle out in different ways. So everyone is contributing to um, the conversation. Thank you very much. I know I've rambled through pretty quickly, but it's because we didn't have time. Um, I'm just uh, posting this link uh, for the standard. You can have a look at it and purchase if you would like to. Thank you. So I just want to say thank you, Sylvia. And you know, the points that you covered, actually Rama and Budwa also covered in their talk. So I guess, if you want your company to survive 100 plus years, and if you want your company to be profitable and sustainable, then um, your leadership style should be feminist. And today at an event earlier, I said, feminism sometimes has this you know, wrong connotation. Feminist means if you believe in equality, that means you're a feminist. So if you believe in equality, it's good for the company, it's good for the country, it's good for you and your family too. So thank you for sharing your wonderful thoughts. And uh, we've completely run out of time, but uh, I'm really conscious that this conversation was really important and we had two amazing CEOs share their thoughts with us. Meena, any last words from you? Yeah, just to thank everyone for being here, but mainly to Rama and because they were super open. And, and I think that is what we need to have a space in which we can share on this space in which we talk about every topic and that we can share and we learn all, all together. So it has been amazing being here. Thank you, Elsa. Thank, Thank you, everyone. You. Thank you, everyone. Have a wonderful evening and happy International Women's Day to everyone. Bye. Thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.